26-year-old John Edward Jones was born in Sandy, Utah. He had a big family of five boys and two girls and 16 nieces and nephews. According to his family, he was known for his good nature, delightful sense of humor, strong work ethic, a genuine love of people, and a masterful ability to relate to children. At 26, John was in the prime of his life. He was married, he had a one-year-old daughter, and was attending medical school in Virginia studying to become a pediatric cardiologist. But he came back home to Utah to spend some relaxing holiday time with his family. During his childhood, his father would frequently take him and his brother Josh on caving expeditions in Utah, but it had been years since John was last in any cave. John, his brother Josh, and nine other friends and family members ventured out to the Nutty Putty Cave around 8 p.m. The Nutty Putty Cave was known for its notoriously narrow spaces and a popular location for splunkers. However, the cave had been closed to public access for years after a few visitors had to be rescued from getting stuck in its passageways. It had only reopened under an online reservation system managed by the local caving organization in early 2009. Almost an hour into the caving expedition, John decided to find the formation known as the Birth Canal, which was a tight passage that splunkers must crawl through carefully. He found what he thought was the birth canal and inched his way into the narrow passage head first, moving forward using his hips, stomach, and fingers. But within minutes, he realized he'd made a grave mistake. It is unclear from the conflicting sources on the internet whether John entered the birth canal and accidentally turned and wriggled into the scout eater, or if he had missed the birth canal entirely and crawled into another passageway just next to the birth canal called Ed's Push. Ed's push does not lead to a larger room. It does not lead anywhere, at least nowhere a six foot, 200 pound man can fit. Ed's push had four uncharted passageways at its end, but they are all too small for a human. And if he instead pushed into the scout eater, it similarly has a small passageway that doesn't lead anywhere. In any case, John kept pushing through until he couldn't continue. To top things off, he had wriggled into a fissure that went nearly straight down, which made him unable to turn back on his own. The narrow crevice he was trapped in measured 10 by 18 inches. This size is comparable to the opening of a front-loading washing machine, except it wasn't a perfect circle, and he was stuck in the tightest part of the opening. Trapped more than 100 feet below the ground and deep inside the cave, all John could do was wait and pray. His brother Josh, who was following him, was the first one to find him. Anxious of how much the rock had swallowed John, Josh tried pulling him out, but only managed to inch him up a little. As soon as he let John go, John slid right back into the crevice. He was stuck with one hand pinned underneath him and the other forced backward. His ankles and feet were free, but were of little use as gravity pushed him down. All they could do at this point was pray together. Guide us as we work through this, Josh prayed. Save me for my wife and kids, John said. The first person to arrive to help, Susan, was the local rescue volunteer who immediately dropped everything she was doing when she received the message on her rescue pager and rushed to the scene with her Toyota. She arrived sometime around midnight it was now more than three hours since John had been trapped deep inside the cave. Small, agile, and quick, Susan took no time to reach John. Hi, John, my name is Susie. How's it going? Hi, Susie, thanks for coming, John said, but I really, really want to get out. Within the next few hours, tens and tens of rescuers arrived. The rescue team quickly brainstormed a plan after a plan. They discussed everything, even lubing the walls of the cave, until they decided to use a rescue rope that passes through a series of climbing cams with one end of the rope tied around John's legs and the other end pulled by the team. At the same time, they also tried drilling away chunks of rocks near John, but the hard material in the awkward position made drilling a slow and painful work. In over an hour, they only managed to drill through a couple of inches of rock. 
The position of John's body also complicated things. He was chopped nearly upside down, only his feet were visible to the rescuers, and the ceiling above the feet hung so low the rescuers couldn't just pull him out as his feet would get in the way. Time passed as rescue workers frantically and failed with their first system of climbing cams. They then tried to use a rope pulley system, anchoring the pulleys with bolts, drilling the bolts deep in the cave walls. Everything was made more difficult by how narrow the cave was. Even though there was one large team of rescuers, volunteers, emergency services, and a rescue helicopter outside, only one person could directly access John. Meanwhile, John was doing worse. He had now been stuck upside down for 19 hours and started having some difficulty breathing, and his heart had to work twice as hard against gravity to push the continuous blood flow out of his brain. He was swinging back and forth between panic and calmness. At one point, they brought a two-way cable radio into the cave and managed to lower it to him so he could speak with his wife, who was near the cave entrance on the surface. They were both agitated, but comforted each other. To further complicate the situation, John's ribcage would catch on a lip of rock when the rescuers attempted to pull him back up and over the crux. Everything changed on the afternoon of November 25th, when the rescuers finally finished installing their pulley system and started pulling John out. They worked in an eight-men tandem, all tugging as one. John was at times in great pain, so they made frequent pauses, but each time they pulled, they managed to pull John up a bit more. After pulling him upwards the third time, John was finally lifted high enough so that he could make eye contact with the rescuer closest to him. He looked tired, his eyes were red, and his face was dirty, but he seemed fine otherwise. The rescuer asked, how are you? And John replied, it sucks, I'm upside down, I can't believe I'm upside down, my legs are killing me. The rescuer saw that even though John was complaining, he had a smile on his face. They had another rest, then decided to continue pulling John up, and he was almost out. But when the rescue team pulled John upwards for the fourth time, something happened. The entire team fell backwards as the rope suddenly went loose in their hands. The closest rescuer felt something hard hit his face, and he passed out for a second. When he came to, he saw nothing but dust. Once the dust had settled a bit, he realized the stone arc near John's legs where the rope was tied around had shattered and the nearest key bolt had broken off. He couldn't make out the dust where exactly John was, but soon he realized. John had slid right down the crevice again, this time seemingly even deeper than before. As the rescuer suffered severe facial injuries from the impact with a metal carabiner and couldn't continue his rescue efforts, he had switched places with his dad, who was also on the rescue team. When he reached John, he realized that John's breathing was much more shallow and less frequent, and he was struggling to stay alive. The rescuer called for John, but received no response. Desperate, he tried to lower himself into the crevice to put the rope around John's waist, but got stuck himself. After finally wriggling himself free, he drilled a new hole for the pulley and crawled out of the cave, exhausted, to be replaced by yet another rescuer who reached John, but couldn't make contact with him. Soon after, a medical professional crawled into the cave and reached John. At 11.56 p.m., the search and rescue team determined that John had died. A total of 137 rescuers worked hard for 27 hours to save John but had to leave the tragic sight with empty hands and heavy hearts. One of them told the media this was his toughest rescue in his 29 years of being a search and rescue volunteer. The next day, the authorities determined that it was too difficult and dangerous to get his body out of the cave. There were some discussions about how to get him out, and the county sheriff added that there were some rather distasteful discussions as well and things that nobody really wanted to do. In the end, the decision was made to leave him in place. Uniformed deputies remained at the opening of the cave 24 hours a day, 
from the night of John's death until Nutty Putty's permanent closure the following week. On December 1, 2009, the county's bomb squad entered Nutty Putty to place explosive charges around the opening of the passageway in which John remained trapped. The next day, on December 2nd, Contractors poured concrete into the main opening of the cave. John's family had a plaque put on the entrance of the cave in his memory. His wife Emily was actually pregnant with John's second child at the time, and they both planned on announcing her pregnancy to his family on Thanksgiving Day, but unfortunately would not have the chance to do so. After his death, she gave birth to their son, John Edward Jones II, started a photography business, and remarried in 2012. Her now husband asked for her family's and John's family's permission prior to their marriage, and they welcomed a son in 2014. May John rest in paradise and blessings shower upon Emily and her family. Thank you all for watching.